However, things don't always work out so nicely as that. I mean, as this thing oscillates back and forth, is that 6.28 seconds for the repeat itself? Or if it happens to be, then we'll just change that. We got a different value now, or a different value now. So the way that you deal with that is it's the number that goes in front of t. So if I have cosine of omega t, I want to know when it starts repeating itself. Well, it starts to repeat itself when omega times t is equal to 2 pi. It starts at 0, and then when, when they get around to 2 pi, that's when it repeats itself. And so if we're talking about one period, then I can use a capital T there. So my period is 2 pi divided by omega, which is whatever the number is in front of t. It happens to be the angular frequency, as mentioned earlier. So if I have cosine of 3t, my period is going to be 2 pi divided by 3 seconds. Assuming time is in seconds. In essence, if you think of a, uh, an arrow going around in a circle at a constant angular speed, if I put a 3 in front, it's going around 3 times faster. In other words, it gets it finishes the cycle in a third of the time. So if it's doing this three times faster, what happens to my graph here? I think I'm on Yeah, because what used to finish at two pi now finishes in a third of that time. So what does that do to my slope? If I take this and I squinch it up so that it's now doing this. Slope goes down, so when I go from here to here. Oh, no, it increases. Yeah. Matter of fact, it increases by a factor of three. Hey, what a coincidence. That's the number I have right there. So if my displacement is cosine of omega t, my velocity is whatever that number is times a negative there, negative sine <coughs> omega t. In my acceleration, we do it again. So every time I do this, whatever number's in front, I just multiply it out front, so this becomes negative omega squared cosine omega t. So every time you go down, whatever, again, if omega's in front of t, omega just get a new omega every time you do the slope. Now here I have an amplitude of 1, because it's just cosine t. Suppose I made my amplitude 2. What would that do to the graph? If I had 2 in front. Which way? Not that way. Yeah, there we go. The other choice. So if I put a 2 in front, that's my amplitude, then it makes it go longer, this way. So the number next to omega will shrink it or stretch it out this way. If omega is less, bigger than 1, it goes this way. Less than 1, it goes that way. My amplitude, if it's bigger than 1, it goes this way. Less than 1, it goes this way. And so now we can look at a full set here. If my displacement is equal to some number times the cosine of omega t, then v is going to be equal to a omega, negative a omega sine omega t. And my acceleration is negative a omega squared cosine omega t. Now notice, with my notation here, I drop my vector symbols, and that's because, for whatever frickin' tradition there it is, they often get dropped. Uh, they're still there, these are still vectors. And I also drop the delta in front of the x, technically this should be delta in front of it. But when you're dealing with harmonic motion, and again, simple harmonic motion is motion that obeys Hooke's law, which is 
that right there. It's understood that the position is always relative to equilibrium. So if I plug into here, I have negative k times whatever the amplitude is, cosine of omega t. Just did not give myself enough room. Negative k times a cosine of omega t equals m times negative a omega squared cosine of omega t. And now we can get rid of stuff. The minus signs will go away. Cosine omega t goes away. A goes away. What I'm left with is this k number is equal to m omega squared. In other words, if this is always true, then the coefficient of cosine must always be equal to each other. And so if I solve for omega squared, omega squared is equal to k over m. Omega is equal to the square root of k over m. So let's actually do a problem. I have a spring hanging vertically. And yes, I do mean to do it vertically here. I then attach a three kilogram mass to it, and it stretches uh, four meters. I then take that same spring and I put it on a horizontal surface, and I pull it out five meters. And let go. So it'll oscillate back and forth. What's my period? What's the period of oscillation? Let's take it step by step. The first bit, where I'm hanging it vertically and I put a mass on it and let it see where it hangs. This is, I don't know if I said it explicitly, I thought it intensely, this is an equilibrium down here. In other words, the weight of it should be equal to the spring force acting up. So mg acting down, k delta x acting up. The minus sign gives me a direction so that I know it's acting up. The, the negatives are already taken care of. So k times however far it's been displaced equals mg since it's in equilibrium. In other words, k is equal to mg over delta x. Again, the whole purpose of, the, of this first bit was just so we can get the spring constant, k. So this will be 3 times 9.8 divided by 4. Seven point four something. Seven point three five. Three five. Ooh. Units. Units of weight. No, that's mass. Closer oh. meters per second. Closer. Yeah, and a kilogram meter per second squared is also known as.
Yes. It could be said without the question mark. Also. Newton. Yeah, there we go. And then the units of the four? Meter. Meter, yeah. So this is Newtons per meter. It takes 7.35 Newtons to stretch it a meter. It takes 14.7 Newtons to stretch it two meters. It takes 22.05 Newtons to stretch it three meters. In other words, I'm just multiplying K times how far I'm going to stretch it. We dealt with this when we dealt with the spring at the bottom of the ski slope. Not driving it, I just gave it to you at that point. All right, so now I put it horizontally. I know that my displacement is going to be equal to my generic equation, A cosine omega t. There's another factor there that I'm leaving off for right now. I'll bring that in in just a second. My amplitude, that's how far I pull it out. In other words, when time is zero, what's my displacement? In this problem, what is my displacement when time is zero? When I let go, what was it? Not, we're down here. Oh, uh, five meters. Yeah, five meters. I pull it out five meters when I let go. I'm going to start, start the clock at that moment right there, when I, as soon as I let go. So my displacement is equal to five meters times the cosine of omega t. Well, let's see, what is omega? Well, omega is the square root of k over m. That's what we just derived down here. So that's the square root of 7.35 divided by 3, which was my mass. So 1.56? Units? Units? Doing it bit by bit, so that would be the square root of newtons per meter over kilograms, which is the square root of a kilogram meter per second squared per meter kilogram, which is the square root of one over second squared, which is one over seconds. Somewhat misleading here. So if you put one over seconds, yeah, that's right. If you said hertz, it would not be right. What are the traditional units of angular frequency? Isn't it radians per second? It is, radians per second. All right, so that's omega. So this is 1.565 radians per second times time. I know from what we did earlier that omega is equal to 2 pi times the frequency. Therefore, the frequency is 1 over 2 pi times omega. My period is 1 over the frequency, so this becomes 2 pi times, well, basically 2 pi over omega. Hey, that showed up again. It was written up the part there. So 2 pi over 1.565. Five radians per second. That's technically two pi radians. Four point something. Somewhere around four. Two pi over what? Over omega. The one point five six five. So four point oh fourteen. Four point oh one four. Mm -hmm. Units. And so that's in seconds? Yep, seconds. Okay. So this thing's going to oscillate back and forth four times a second. Uh, not four times a second, four seconds per time. But we have enough information here. We can now 
figure out what the velocity is. Hey, I have this right here, my velocity. Somewhere there's room. My velocity is going to be negative a omega sine omega t. Well, I know what omega is. I know what my amplitude is, so I can figure out this amplitude. So negative, well, whatever 5 times 1.565 is. meters per second times the sine of 1.565 radians per second times time. Well, I can know what my acceleration formula is because that's just going to be whatever I had for velocity in front times my omega again. It's just that times omega. So what is 7.82 times 1.565? So that's what was that? Meters per second squared times the cosine of 1.565 radians per second times time. So I now have a formula, I have three formulas here to describe the motion on this object. I can also then find the jerk of it if I need to, or snap, crackle, pop. So now I can say, what's going on at one second? What's the position? What's the velocity? What's the acceleration? Well, you have a formula here. You plug in one for time. The biggest trick, the biggest mistake I see students make once they get this far is having the calculator in the wrong mode. These are radians. If I plug in one second, I'm going to have radians. Uh, and hand some stuff back. Oh, I guess the, the one thing to put on here is test corrections by end of the semester.